question nine then, and we're asked if we take a pendulum to another planet and a mass spring system to another planet, they both originally have a time period of t, what's going to happen to those time periods? Well, we're going to look straight away at our formula booklet again. We're going to find that the time period for a pendulum, we'll call that tp, is given by 2 pi root L over G. Normally, of course, we'd write T, but I'm going to use the P just to remind us because we've got more than one equation for time period here. So it's going to be L over G. And the time period of the spring system, we'll call that TS, just put a comma in between those two, uh, is going to again be given by 2 pi root something, and in this case, it's going to be root M over K. Now the first thing we're going to notice is that if we take this to another planet, the spring system is not going to have any effect at all on its time period. Because 2 pi is of course going to remain constant, the stiffness of the spring is going to remain constant, and the mass on another planet is going to remain constant as well. So this thing is going to be unchanged. We know that the time period of the spring system is unchanged. So that helps us out a little bit. Terrible handwriting. TS is unchanged. Time period of the pendulum though is going to be a little bit different because it does depend on this value of g. So all we're going to do now is write a new equation for the time period of the pendulum on the new planet. We can call that TP nu. And we're putting it on the planet where the value of g is going to be twice as great. So we can write this as 2 pi root L over 2g. Now the trick here now is going to be try to rearrange this equation so it's in terms of TP and we can work out what the factor is of TP that we're multiplying in order to get the time period um, on the new planet. So what we can do here is recognise that this is going to be 2 pi square root of L over G times the square root of 1 over 2 because we could just combine these two together and get L over 2G. That would be fine. Well, this 2 pi root L of G is the same as TP, so we can call this TP root 1 over 2. And, of course, this is equal to TP divided by root 2, because the square root of 1 over 2 is just the square root of 1, which is 1 over the square root of 2, which is root 2. So it's 1 over root 2. So we're multiplying this by 1 over root 2, which is the same as dividing by root 2. So the pendulum time now is going to be um, the original time divided by root 2. And the original time for the uh, spring system is going to be the same as it is now. So we're looking at C for that one, 9C, T over uh, root 2, and T for the mass spring system, 9 is C. Question 10 is a little bit tricky, really. Um, it's written in a slightly unusual way. So we're looking at a graph where it's telling us how the amplitude changes with frequency. Uh, we're noting a couple of things. We're noting that the graph that we're looking for has got to best show the lightest damping. And we're noticing that as the frequency changes, the, uh, the amplitude of the oscillations is changing for each of these. Now we need to be remembering a couple of things. First of all, the lightest damping means that it's going to have very little effect upon the amplitude. So we're looking for large amplitudes in our graphs here. That's our first clue. Our second clue, really, is going to be remembering the effect of resonance. So when we have the frequency equal to the, uh, the that is, the driving frequency is equal to the natural frequency of the oscillatory system, we're going to have resonance. And when the frequency is too high or too low, we're going to have less. So the amplitude is going to decrease. So as we increase the frequency up to the natural frequency, we're going to end up with more and more vibration, larger and larger amplitude, which is going to die away again as we continue to increase the frequency beyond the resonant frequency. So with those two facts in mind, we're looking for a graph that goes up and then down, so the amplitude increases as we get to a certain frequency, and then down again. And lightest damping means that we're going to be decreasing the amplitude by hardly anything at all, so we're looking for a nice large graph here. These two, of course, are going down, so we can discount those straight away. The amplitude has got to be rising and falling. And this one here shows us with the largest amplitude, so this is the lightest damping uh, graph. It's going to be 10b. 
question 11 is talking about gravitational fields. It would be helpful, I think, to draw a diagram here. So we've got our object, and we know that for a planet we end up with a radial field that looks a little bit like that. And we're going to assess each of these statements and see if we can work out whether they are true or false. The first one, moving a mass in the direction of the field lines reduces its potential energy. That's like moving an object from here to here. Well, if we move it from here to here, we know that we've got to be doing work against this gravitational field, so it must be increasing its potential, increasing its potential energy as well. So moving it back down is going to reduce its potential energy. A must be correct. B, a stronger field represented by a greater density of field lines. Again, this must be true. When we're closer to the planet, we have these field lines close together. For example, the further away we get, the more spaced out those field lines become, and that corresponds to a weaker field. We know the further away we get from this planet, um, the field strength is going to be less and less and less. Uh, and hopefully, you wouldn't need to be working that out in the exam. You would just know that when you see your field lines concentrated in a small area, um, at greater density, that means that you're going to have a stronger field being represented there. Moving a mass perpendicularly across the field lines doesn't alter its potential energy. Um, to clearly illustrate that, we can look at a situation of uniform field. So if I have my field lines here for uniform field, they should be equally spaced out. And they should be parallel to each other. If I move a mass perpendicularly, I can move it from here, for example, to here. If I do that, then I'm moving essentially across a line of equipotential, and so here's my line of equipotential, and that means that I'm having no energy uh, being transferred, we're not increasing or decreasing potential energy, so C is going to be correct as well. D then has to be false, it has to be incorrect. Why is that? A distance R from a mass, the field strength is inversely proportional to R. Well, that has to be wrong because we know, again from the formula sheet, that the field strength is going to be given by gm over r squared. So it's not inversely proportional to r, it's inversely proportional to the square of r. It is an inverse square law. So 11 must be d.